listen only mode. Hello and welcome to today's premium account market update for April 2016. Any individual reading or listening should discuss with their financial planner or advisor the merits of any recommendation offer presented in this material for their own specific circumstances and realise that not all investments are appropriate for every individual. Presented today myself, Leon Hine, Managing Director of Investor Signals. The topics for today, we look at the macro update driving global equities. We roll through the ASX top 50 with a focus on F year 16 earnings. We look at the technical trends and conclude with the portfolio allocations and the Australian market outlook. The premium account service that Investor Signals offers is a model portfolio of ASX top 50 stocks. We utilise call options to enhance portfolio returns. We're focused on effective ownership around ex-dividend dates, generating above average cash flow, capital growth, strict inv all under a strict investment mandate, and importantly, the assets remain in your name. If you'd like to know more about the Investor Signals service, please contact me, Leon, at Investor Signals. Dot com. Moving straight into a graph of the US market and up on screen is a graph of the Dow Jones. Now, uh, in some ways, the US market's the last man standing. What we've seen is a fall off in Europe. We've seen a fall off in Japan. Uh, obviously, China's been in a downtrend for quite some time. The Australian market has underperformed and in general, emerging uh, markets have underperformed, albeit in the last month they've had a bounce back. So really what the key decision for investors is, is it, what does the outlook for the US uh, equities look like over the next, say, six months, and in particular, what does the US economy look like? So as I go through today's recording, we'll look at some of the benchmark uh, indices or signposts there for us to help sort of form a view on that. I'll highlight what my concerns are from a technical perspective, and then we'll uh, drill into the ASX top 50 stocks and look at sort of where the opportunities exist. But uh, at 17 times earnings, the S&P 500 is reasonably expensive given there's a lot of uncertainty around what the March quarter earnings are going to look like. So uh, next week we begin to see the start of those earnings results come through. I think you probably get a little bit of sell-off coming into the earnings result. Maybe the earnings results don't dis don't um, uh, disappoint as much as the market's anticipating. But nevertheless, I still think the pressure's to the downside so in the US market, we're mindful of the fact that it appears that we're starting to put in a lower high here in the Dow. Let's have a quick look at the uh, NASDAQ. So same sort of thing here. It's the beginning of what looks to be a structural lower low, lower high pattern beginning to form in US indices. Now, we've had that for many months in the other global indices. We're now maybe just starting to see that same setup in the US. Uh, and I'll just sort of, so here we are as a Shanghai composite. So uh, we've seen the Chinese market rally back substantially from its lows. Again, it looks to be putting in a lower high. Uh, and looking at, say, gold, for example, we're seeing gold breaking higher, uh, putting in a higher high, higher low structure. So gold appears to be starting to develop a fairly bullish structure. And then up on screen at the moment is the 10-year treasuries, which if the US economy is going strong enough where they're able to raise interest rates, we'd expect to start to see this. the um, yield on the treasury start to trend back up at the moment. The technical picture there still looks quite weak. So it would appear that maybe the US raise interest rates another 50 uh, basis points this year. But you know, there's not the underlying strength in the US economy like um, you know, the Federal Reserve would like us to believe uh, that's what the bond market is telling us. So, and inter interesting, we just saw uh, this week or overnight, uh, Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, comment about uh, what type of effect negative interest rates would have on JP Morgan as a bank and in general the US banking sector. So, it, it'll be interesting to see whether ultimately the US, you know, are able to raise interest rates or whether they. Uh, end up having to follow a similar path to Europe and um, Japan, which have obviously moved down the path of negative interest rates. Uh, on that note, let's uh, move straight into the Australian market and let's roll through the top 50 stocks. So up on screen is a graph of the 
XFL, which is the top 50 index for ASX. And as I've been highlighting in recent recordings over the last sort of six or 12 months, we've got a structural downtrend. And therefore, uh, with the exception of maybe no more than uh, a dozen companies within the top 50, most of them have fairly bearish structures in place. So let's uh, move straight into the top 50 companies and, move, and uh, identify which ones we want to sort of have a bullish exposure to or an overweight exposure to and which ones we want to be sort of more underweight. So AGL, it's expensive, uh, trades on about a 3.5%, 3.7% dividend yield. Um, look, I think this is a buying opportunity on any weakness. I was looking for it to pull back to around $15.50. I'm not so sure we're going to get that type of volatility in the earnings, but you know, any opportunity to pick it up, maybe around $17.50, keen to take a look at AGL. Asiano, we're just seeing some comments out of the ACCC around what the Brookfield cube um, takeover looks like and that's just created a little bit of short-term uh, questions and doubt around the transaction which is weighing on the price of Asiano but ultimately expect that to get across the line uh, and we're interested in what cube looks like post the transaction and of course still one of our preferred holdings so this has been an overweight position in client portfolios the company's come out and reaffirmed earnings guidance trading on about three percent dividend yield so getting a little bit expensive but it's fairly defensive earnings characteristics but up at these levels I think you need to be selling calls so I don't see that there's really going to trade too much higher given the yield compression that we're seeing at the moment and sort of those question marks that I've highlighted about the global economy. But a good stable uh, stock to have in your portfolio, sell the covered calls, driving around 10% cash flow from the dividend and the call option income. AMP, so this looks a little bit negative at the moment. I think this is just reflective of concerns around the outlook for global equities and obviously as equity markets uh, retreat, then um, that has an impact on the funds under management fees for some of these financial services firms, uh, AMPs included. So to me, it looks like maybe AMP could trade down to sort of that sort of closer to maybe $5 to $5.25 range. Interesting to have a look at it at that level. The ANZ still um, pressure to the downside. And in most client portfolios, we hedged ANZ through selling in the money covered calls, which gave us protection of around about two dollars in the month of uh, in the month of April. I think what we're probably likely to see is further softness in these banking stocks. But again, I, I think probably there's a reasonable chance that the earnings results in the U.S. don't disappoint as much as the market's starting to price in. So maybe there's a, a a trading opportunity because I still think we're probably in a period of lower lows and lower highs for the banking sector, but maybe we actually get a bounce sometime throughout the middle of this month, you know, through till probably late May, given that the Australian banks report their earnings result in early May. And again, I think that may appease the concerns that the market has of the immediate tick up in bad debts. I think over the next year or two, there's definitely a probably we've probably hit the cyclical low of where um, you know non-performing loans uh, begin to start to increase over the next couple of years, which will weigh on bank earnings, weigh on dividend payout ratios. Um, but again, from a trading perspective, let's keep a close eye on this. I think over the next week or two, there's a buy on the dip opportunity and then uh, sell the rally. Uh, in the case of ANZ. <laughs> trading on around about a five and a half, six percent dividend yield at the moment. APA Group, this is one of the few stocks that has a bullish structure, and I think there's an argument that this belongs in portfolios. ASX, I actually like this name, but it is getting expensive. Trading on around about a 4.75 percent dividend yield. Uh, we've seen um, the uh, cap on international ownership increase to 15 percent, and a clear pathway made for an off sure acquirer to probably not run into the same issues that we had under the Liberal government. So I think ASX is a potential acquisition target over the next six to 12 months. That provides a bit of natural protection to the downside and the share price. But at these levels, the stock's good value on a 5% dividend yield at around 43, 44, it starts to get a little bit expensive. Uh, Horizon, I think this name looks okay, albeit still the technical structure's pretty heavy and pushing to the downside, but fair value is probably 
probably somewhere around three seventy-five to four dollars. So selling the covered calls up around four twenty-five makes sense there in AZJ. BHP, so trading now on around about what looks about a three percent dividend yield, and I think we're sort of sitting at around fair value. I don't see oil actually having a major leg down from where it sits at the moment. Brambles, one of the few stocks again with higher highs, higher lows. The stock's expensive on just under a three percent dividend yield, but we're buyers of it again here at around twelve dollars, and we're selling fairly tight covered calls out into the back half of the year to collect the August dividend and uh, and generate the extra cash flow from the call option. So instead of getting a 3% dividend or 3% cash flow off the stock on an annualized basis, we're pushing that up closer to around 10%. CBA pressure to the downside here. Uh, look, my view on the banks is all the same. I think there's probably a buy on the dip um, coming into the start. And I really think the catalyst will probably be when JP Morgan report their earnings result early in the US earnings sort of season for these March numbers. I think that'll probably allay some of the concerns of the market and we'll start to see a rally. So again, looking for a rally in the banks from probably starting next week, mid next week through till probably the early part of May, but then you know seeking to sell the, sort of that rally. Uh, so in the case of CBA, we may see a move back up to around $75, uh, $76, but don't see too much more upside than that. Uh, and you know, over the next couple of days, it's probably today's session and Monday, Tuesday, it's likely to remain heavy given the weakness in the US market. Coca-Cola, so the underlying earnings, as I've alluded to, have started to improve with around 5% underlying growth. The stock's on a 5% dividend yield. I think it largely tracks sideways, but want to be selling covered calls up around 9 25, 950 to drive the extra income. Computer share, I think this company um, is probably sitting back at around fair value at the moment, and we've been pretty aggressive with selling covered calls up at around this 1050 level. Uh, it trades sideways mostly for the next six months or so, but we'll continue to re-evaluate whether computer share is the right name to be in portfolios or whether we're better off reallocating that capital into other names. CSL, so strong earnings growth here of around 10%. The stock's got a bullish structure in place. I think it's a buy on sort of this uh, pullback that we've had to $100, and we're going out to December selling the $110 calls. So giving us around 10% capital growth through to the end of the year, but from the dividend and the call option income, we're generating about 5%, 6% cash flow over the nine months through to December. Keltex is one of our preferred names in portfolios. I think this can trade back up to around $37, $38. So we own it at these levels. We've sold the covered calls, again, driving sort of that dividend yield from 4% up to around 10% cash flow. Dexas, I think this looks okay, and it's probably a buy on the dip on any pullback from where it is at the moment, as is the case with Goodman Group. So all these property stocks are expensive, but given the falling uh, yields uh, globally, uh, and I, I think there's probably more to go in these names, or at least owning them and selling at the money covered calls, collecting the dividends, collecting the call option income, again, getting sort of closer to probably 10 or 12% cash flow out of them, not much in the way of capital growth, but I think that's a fairly defensive way to drive returns for a portfolio out of the market at the moment. Uh, IAG, so we, we've sold calls around the 550 level here in IAG, uh, and I think that's really just sort of captures where fair value for the stock is. Trades on around about a 6.5% dividend yield, uh, and that, that 550 is where we see fair value. IPL at the moment, sort of the pressure to the downside, so we're not doing anything there. James Hardy, possibly looking for this to roll over, albeit the US housing market continues to remain sort of an area of strength. So whilst on the fundamentals suggest that James Hardy should move higher, the technical picture looks a little bit heavy. So we keep an eye on that, but we don't have it in portfolios at present. Lendlease, we've been fairly aggressive. We're selling the calls up here at around 1450. Now uh, the stock should deliver okay earnings well in sort of the uh, August earnings result period for the Australia market. I have Lendlease trading on about a 4.5% dividend yield, and they should deliver maybe close to 8 to 10% earnings growth. But technically, the pressure's still to the downside there in Lendlease. Uh, Mervac really moving sideways, not our preference of uh, exposure within the property area of the market. Medibank Private, this has been a stellar performer for portfolios, and we continue to sort of reassess where we've owned it at lower levels and taken profit at around the sort of the 260 level. 
Um, for clients that are not holding Medibank at the pri at the moment, I'm certainly looking for the right opportunity to buy back into the stock and maybe somewhere around $2.75 and then going out and selling the $3 calls into the end of the year as the trade there in Medibank Private. But that's one that I think should remain in portfolios. Macquarie, so interesting when you look at what's happening in the US investment bank. So we've seen Goldman Sachs, um, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, all the US banks are under pressure. The only real benchmark we can have to that when you're looking at the Australian market is Macquarie. Um, and the picture here is not that dissimilar to say Goldman Sachs when you look at the technical structure here in Macquarie compared to Goldman Sachs. What's a little bit unknown is do we have a 10% sell-off in US equities uh, and in the Australian market and we see Macquarie back at around $55. But there's no doubt that the technical structure of the market would probably suggest that that's more than likely what the way things will play out. Whether that can happen in the course of the next week or so, and then we get the bounce into the US earnings, uh, or the market sort of muddles sideways, and again, the US earnings are not quite as bad as uh, what the market's fearing. Um, I think that's a pretty difficult uh, scenario to try to uh, be certain on. Uh, what we do know is the, so, so the pressure is still remains to the downside on all these financial note for services names at the moment. Um, so the Australian banks, I think we get a little bit more robust picture here with the with the Aussie banks, and my view is that again over the next week we're probably getting fairly close to a low being established and a bounce beginning to occur. New Chris, as I highlighted at the beginning of the recording, we're seeing gold trade higher. It's putting in higher highs and higher lows. Uh, and I think maybe there's a fairly strong argument to say having some exposure to gold at these levels continues to be rewarding. Uh, origin, so we've seen oil pull back from sort of $40 a barrel back down to sort of 34s. Uh, I don't see it going too much below 32, but equally a strong recovery in oil is not going to happen at best until the end of this year. In the case of Origin, we've sold the 550 calls to generate some extra income to complement the dividend. They expire at the end of April. I think we're pretty safe there. Um, out of Origin Oil Search, Santos, Woodside Petroleum, uh, they're all essentially providing that same negative structure. Uh, and if oil finds support at around $32 a barrel, then maybe we get a short-term low in the next week or two in some of these energy names. Orica, we've seen a, a negative structure there with pressure to the downside. Oil Search, as I mentioned as well, we've got negative structure here and pressure to the downside. Uh, Qantas has been one of the few names that has a higher high and higher low. Uh, Qantas, there's a chance of a special dividend or share buyback that's likely to be announced over the course of the next 6 to 12 months, which should continue to underpin the share price in a low oil environment. QBE, I think the structure here is negative, and that's just reflective of the lower bond yields in the US and the at a company-specific level, QBE's insurance margins have been uh, under pressure uh, and, and uh, certainly less than that of, say, Suncorp or IAG. Um, but <clears throat> with QBE trading on a yield of around 5.5%, it'll be a stock that'll be very interesting to take a look at their earnings result uh, come the, sort of the August earnings period. But again, from a technical perspective, the pressure's still to the downside there. Ramsey Healthcare, I think this just trades sideways. Uh, I've highlighted in previous recordings at 26 times earnings and less than a 2% dividend yield. I think the market at the moment's not willing to pay too much uh, higher PE for around 10 to 15% forward earnings growth. So I think it really just tracks sideways at these levels. Uh, Rio, so... Interesting that the uh, shipping of iron ore out of the Pilbara region for all the negativity in the media about global demand uh, is actually up roughly 2% now on the same time last year. So that can partly be put down to the increase in production that Rio and BHP's had and then obviously the Roy Hill mine coming online as well. Um, but I Iron ore prices have performed reasonably well over the la over really the course of 2016. I actually think we're probably sitting reasonably close to where a support level is in BHP and Rio. But again, the technical picture sort of shows that the pressure's to the downside at the moment. Uh, 
Uh, South 32, not doing anything there at the moment. SCG, this is one of the names that I think belongs in portfolios. Again, the more I look at this relative to other areas of the market, I think there's some defensive income char characteristics here. I don't think there's much in the way of capital growth. So if we're owning this name, we want to be selling the covered calls, which is what we've been doing. We've been selling the 450 covered calls out to December and a combination of that call income and the dividend, we're generating about 30 cents of income over the course of the next, say, eight to nine months, which in a name that I think the downside risk is pretty limited, that cash flow is great versus sort of where bank interest rates are at. Uh, Seek, I think this is a name that now belongs in portfolio. So this is starting to move into a high, 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 low structure. Trades on around about 2.3, 2.5% dividend yield. I was concerned after the earnings result missed early in the season and then the latest uh, result uh, coming through in the early part of, say, in February, uh, highlighted that the company delivered good revenue growth, good profit growth. So I think it's a buy on the dip, but again, we want to be selling covered calls to complement the ownership of Seek. Uh, Stocklands, it's a really fair value. I see this tracking sideways at around $4. The stock trades on a five and a half, almost 6% dividend yield, 6% underlying earnings growth. But given the sort of concerns around Australian residential property at the moment, I don't think it's too aggressive. So we own it at these levels, but selling sort of an at the money covered calls the right strategy there in Stockland. Sonic, I actually think this business looks all right. The growth numbers coming through from uh, Europe uh, over the last 12 months look okay. There's a bit of uncertainty around what Australian earnings look like following the um, uh, reduction in the uh, rebates from the government. Um, and for that reason, when you tie that in with the technical structure of lower lows, lower highs, maybe the stock could trade down to around 1650. But to the extent that we own it, we've been aggressive in selling the covered calls. And the view really has been over the course of this year, the stock should mostly trade sideways. So again, collecting that dividend and collecting the call option income, we're driving about 10% cash flow. Santos, still the pressures to the downside, but as I alluded to with these oil names, I think at around $32 a barrel oil finds support and doesn't trade too much lower. Suncorp, so this technical structure is negative here, and we've been going out and selling covered calls to drive the extra income there. Sydney Airports is one of the few bullish names in portfolio, so we own it at lower levels. We've gone out and sold the covered calls into the 675 into September. I think this is one of the names that uh, belong in portfolios, uh, but again, only you, you, only with complementing the 4% dividend yield with a call option. I don't see that for a 4% dividend yield, it's worth risking capital in some of these names. So to me, the call option overlay is just critical to get a fair risk adjusted return in portfolios. And that same applies for Transurban now on a 4% dividend yield. The encouraging thing here with Transurban is the dividends being covered from free cash flow and it looks like the dividend yield will grow from around 45 cents of distributions per annum up to around 50 cents, so about 10% growth in the dividend payout over the next sort of one to two years consistently should probably ensure that the stock as a minimum at least trade sideways at these valuations. And again, if we complement that with a covered call, bumps the cash flow up to around 10%. Uh, Telstra, so this has been a little under pressure here just with concerns with what uh, the new Australian telecommunication landscape looks like post NBN, uh, some pressure around mobile margins, but any pullback below $5 on sort of general weakness in equities over the next week or two, I think that's an opportunity to pick Telstra up at a fairly cheap price. That would put the stock on probably about a 6.5% dividend yield uh, if we were able to buy in under $5. Um, Vicinity centres, I think, uh, starts to come onto the radar. So any pullback to around three dollars, we're interested in adding this to portfolios. Westpac, in line with all the banks' pressures to the downside, middle of next week, let's take another look and see if uh, there's value presenting in the banks on a short-term bounce. But at the moment, the pressures to the downside. Wes Farmers, I think this belongs in portfolios. This is one of the few stocks that are making higher highs and higher lows on a five percent dividend yield, but. 
I think you've got to recognise with Wes Farmers, the company only delivered 2% earnings growth in the last 12 months. That's down from around 8 to 10% earnings growth the prior year. So momentum suggests that probably over the course of this year, the stock mostly trades sideways. So again, you need to be complementing the ownership of Wes Farmers with a covered call. Uh, and we've been using the $43 call into December to help drive extra returns, which will again, um, add to the dividends that uh, we'll collect in August. Westfield, I think this is a cornerstone investment in portfolios, but it's expensive on 3% or 3.5% dividend yield for a property trust uh, trading on a PE of around 21 times earnings. It's expensive. So again, I think this is a name that trades sideways. We own it here. We've been aggressive with the covered calls and boosting that dividend yield or cash flow up to around 10%. Woolworths continues to remain under pressure, but we've been uh, collecting some call option income along the way, which is helping to uh, deliver additional cash flow. And Woodside Petroleum in line with oil sort of having a pullback. Uh, so if you sort of overlay where oil was at, if we go back sort of you know, two weeks ago, oil was trading at around $40 a barrel. We've now seen a pullback to around 34. I think maybe oil goes down to 32-ish, but ultimately, you know, I don't see it probably going too much below that. And that should sort of mean that in the case of sort of whether it be Woodside, Origin, Santos, etc., we're probably within a few percent of it finding a bit of a short-term uh, support there. And then back to the index. So again, to sort of recap how we're approaching portfolios, um, the defensive names that we like that are on the radar, so just to recap those, AGL, uh, Amcor, I think ASX as a business looks interesting, Brambles looks okay with covered calls, CSL, Keltex, Crown Resorts is one that I didn't comment on, but I think that's probably you know, interesting here at these levels, but your property trusts, GPT, uh, Medibank Private, uh, Centre Group, Seek, Stockland, Sydney Airport, Transurban, you know, Wes Farmers and Westfield. So they're the names that we see as the cornerstone sort of investments in portfolio. We don't see a huge amount of capital growth in those, so we are using the covered calls to enhance the returns. And then more from a sort of trading perspective, we're keeping an eye on the banks coming up as to whether there's a, uh, a bounce in there that we can uh, look to sort of capitalise on short term. Thank you for listening in. If you'd like to know more about the Investor Signal Service, uh, please contact me using the details on screen.